All right, our special guest tonight is Anthony Dominici. Anthony was born and raised in New Orleans, went to school at UNO, graduated in film studies, and went on to be um, a producer and director of a lot of reality television shows. He's in town this week, this month, I'm not sure how long to do his uh, Extreme Makeover uh, House, ma what's the name of it? Home Edition. Home Edition. So uh, please welcome Anthony Dominici. Thanks. Anthony, thanks. So, um, well, tell us about it. How did you fall into that, uh, that uh, corner of the business, making these kinds of shows? Um, well, I guess uh, I started off here in New Orleans as a camera. I'll give you the whole story. Yeah, I, guess. Yeah, I started off here in New Orleans as a camera assistant, at, well, PA first, and the camera assistant on films, you know, in town. Uh, worked on, like, Dead Man Walking and a bunch of also documentaries and stuff like that. And uh, started shooting a little bit as a, as a DP, cinematographer, and um, went to AFI in uh, in '96. I went to AFI to study cinematography, and then actually I switched to uh, uh, to directing. And then my thesis film, uh, you know, played in Sundance, and uh, from that I got my first job actually uh, as a director. Um, on the real world, when they when they uh, shot here in New Orleans, I, I was living in LA, but I came back, applied for the job, and got the job as one of the directors on the show. At the that's the MTV show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that pretty much started my reality uh, career. So you're now you're doing a lot of shows, though. What are the shows you've been involved with? Um, I did Real World for a few seasons, um, Real World in New Orleans, uh, in New York, and some of the challenges. That's back in probably 2001. I started. Doing that, and then from there, I I did a uh, I, I was I produced uh, the Real World Chicago, um, and then um, and then I got asked to produce America's Next Top Model, and I did that for seven seasons. Wow! As the executive producer, that was a big hit, right? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. Oh, and also the Amazing Race was in. I did the Amazing Race for a few seasons. In there. Really? Yeah. The one around the world shooting the strange footage. Yeah. Wow. So I did that for uh, three seasons, and so, actually after. After I, I messed up there, after um, after Real World, I did Amazing Race, and then I did America's Next Top Model, and then I just I'm just starting now with a uh, Extreme Makeover. Um, I'm not really um, producing the show. I'm just sort of observing the season that's currently currently filming, and this right. is the finale uh, that they're shooting here in New Orleans. Um, and then next season, when we start up in June, I'll be executive producer of that show. So you've been a DP, a director, a producer, and executive producer. Yeah. So what's the difference? Um, the DP, director of photography, is the guy behind the camera. That behind the see. camera, yeah, just sort of setting up the shots, and I, you know, I really enjoyed that. Actually, um, I majored in, I, I minored in in, uh, in film at, at UNO, but I majored in fine art photography. My whole background really? was more art, and uh, I thought I was going to be a painter when I was a kid, and then I really got into photography, and that sort of led to cinematography. Yeah, so it's like lighting the scene and setting up the shot and, you know, blocking, helping the director block the scene. And I really enjoyed that a lot, but then I kind of realized I probably wanted to control a little bit more. So then I started directing. So it's really more, you can tell the cameraman what right. to do and where to go and how, to, how I want it to look. And, but also you're dealing with the actors and the script and all that sort of stuff. So it's a little bit more. And then um, I wasn't really planning at all to get into the whole reality Television business. It really, there really wasn't a business much when I started. It was just right. pretty much the real world and cops. I think right, right. in 2000, and then while I was filming here in New Orleans, is when Survivor came on the air, and oh, that's it kind right. of that whole thing blew up after that. I changed it, and then all of a sudden I had a skill set that was sought after. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So, so when you look at when you're the, the director of photography and you're a fine arts photographer. So you're looking at a scene from that standpoint. You're trying to make art out of that every time you look in the camera. Yeah, you're trying to tell the story. You know, when you when you're a, a DP, when I studied at, at the AFI, um, you know, the sort of mentality was, you know, you're telling a story uh, like like a writer is telling a story, the beginning, middle, and end with words. You're as a, as a cinematographer, you're telling that same story in pictures. So it may be, you know, the type of the color of the lighting or the or the length of the lens that you use, or whatever, um, to sort of, you know, like if you want it to be a, a wide angle shot, it, that, that sort of says something as you're viewing it that, you know, a really wide angle shot has a certain sort of 
understood vocabulary, mm. just like a, a long telephoto shot with like only two inches in focus and everything else soft right, focus right. in the background. That sort of gives you an indication of what you know is going on in the scene, and so you, that's how you kind of control the image. So as a cinematographer, that's what we sort of that's the way we studied it, uh -huh. which I thought was really helpful actually. And I use that those skills every day. Um, and all and, your other work. And, and all my work that I do yeah. now in directing and executive producing. It's, it's good to know, it's good to have done, worked on the crews right. and understand what it's like to lug heavy boxes and be a camera assistant, but also know when you walk into a room, like if the lighting's in the wrong spot or if the guy says it's going to take four more hours to do this yeah, and right. I really know it's going to take a half an hour, you know, whatever. Right, right. You sort of know, um, it's, a, it's just a good skill to have. So, um, and again, I never really thought I'd, I'd be a producer, I never really wanted to be a producer, but. If, you know the opportunity presented itself, and and the and the jobs keep getting bigger and better. And why not? You know? you, that's the boss job, right? Yeah. Well, let me ask you this: uh, as a as going back to director of photography, you work for a director. Mm -hmm. In that situation, what do you look for? What's a, what makes a good director if you're a DP? I, I, I guess I don't know. Actually, um, it's it's different for every working relationship. I would say. You know, what I would look, look for is someone who really knows what they want and, and wants to communicate it, but also gives you enough freedom to sort of express what you want to express and is open to the collaboration. But as a cinematographer, I always knew that, well, it's the director's show, and, you know, I would really usually defer to what their ultimate decision was going to be, and I would basically try to present as many options as I could as to, like, this is how I think it should look, and, you know, I want it to be these colors, and it should be low-key lighting, or whatever, you know, all those different, you know, um, visual aspects of, 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 uh, of storytelling. So, um, so that's a really important thing. Um, some, but some DPs would prefer that the director doesn't know anything about cinematography and wants to do it themselves, you know, so it really depends on how you like to work, it's just like with anything else, like, if what? you're in a band, if you want to have a band leader, or if it's just... Or if you just want to have a collaboration. You know. But as a director, then you must have a, a great sensitivity to the DP. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's good to have um, uh, a shorthand that you know, you know, like it's just with anything, if, if, like with, I guess you guys are in music class, so I'll just use yeah, that yeah. reference. Um, you know, if you know how to read music, you can, you can explain something probably better than someone who does, to, to someone uh -huh. who doesn't know how to read music. So it's, you're speaking the same language. I can tell them like I want it to look like this, and I can do that very quickly because I know I know ultimately as a director or or as a, a producer what I'm going after. Have you settled on one or two guys or women that you really particularly like? Um, yeah, in reality, I have a guy that I work with. We actually went to AFI together. We were directors together, really? and um, I hired him on uh, when I did the Real World Chicago when I was producing that show, and he was just like the new guy director. But I really liked him, and I and I and I liked working with him, and um, so it's it's and, and he did all my all pretty much all of my top models with me um, when we worked together. And again, it's just like you're working with your friends, and that's right. a that's a big thing about I'm sure here and also like when I you know I can speak to my experience at AFI especially, where the people who you're going to school with are the people are the next generation. Right, right. So they'll you know you'll be working together. And hopefully you'll get a chance to hire each other, and you know hopefully they'll, hopefully one day someone would hire me because I've hired them or whatever. Right. So it just becomes a real um, you know kind of um, brotherhood, I guess. Now, um, so who who works for you? I'm just going to cover each position if you don't mind. The yeah. DP, who's working for you in that position? Who's who, who are you responsible for? Well, as an executive producer, I'm no, no, for, as oh. a DP. Oh, as a DP, the yeah. DP who's working for me is the um, is the camera assistants. Who are like pulling focus or loading film or whatever you know whatever the format whatever the, the you know, tape you shot whatever. all formats right yeah pretty much film and you know video do you prefer one over the other um, film is always better it's just, it's nicer to have a big old camera and yeah, you're yeah. putting it down and it's you know the image is going to be great like shooting right. 35 millimeter that's always great expensive process though right yeah yeah, yeah but um, and it's a slow process but something that you know kind of you grow to love that sort of the whole the vibe on a set. I really enjoy, you know, when I was when I was a PA, I was like, I don't know why, I just I just sort of uh, really felt that I love being in this in this environment. It's it's a very organized environment, right. and um, it's you know people are always trying to push themselves and and push their craft to the next level, and that's and that's a great experience. And it's also an apprenticeship sort of 
program, you know, from you know, camera assistant. So when I was a loader, I would hope to be a second AC, second camera assistant, and then a first AC. And I, and I got a chance to do all those, all so, those jobs. So that's the team, the, cam the, the loader? The, the loader, the, um, the second AC, who's, um, who will like, do the marks and do the cl sometimes the clapper. Right. Um, and then the first AC, who'd pull focus. Pull focus. Yeah, pull focus is like if you have a, a long film lens, um, you know, the, the depth of field is really um, short, you know, right. especially if you're doing like 35 millimeter. Right. So, um, yeah, so if, if, if an actor is, is here and they walk over there, I'll have to, you know, I see. literally turn the knob on the, on the lens to, 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 to uh, you know, change the focus right. lens so that they're in focus, you know, over there. Right, right. So that's we call that pulling focus. So who were the other people on the team? Those three. And so you have those. You have those people, and you have um, a gaffer who is your sort of right hand man for lighting. They'll they're um, sort of the lead electrician. They'll you'll say I want a nice soft light, and you know, or whatever type of light that you want. You'll say I want a nice soft light, and you know, a kicker in the back, which is like. You know, just like a, a rim, like right. a hard light in the background to light their hair or whatever, and something on the background. You say, "I want it to look like sort of like this," and the light and the gaffer knows all the lighting equipment really well, the different types of lights and the different types of um, um, equipment that they would use to to make that look in a certain way that you want it to to be. And then, um, and then there's also a key grip, who is sort of um, responsible for all the flags and you know if. If, if you need to soften the light and put it through some sort of like a like a scrim or um, a gel, like if you wanted to look orange, the grips would put those things in front of the exactly. lights. All so, those people go to places like AFI, American Film Institute, or go to a UNO, or not? I mean, no, you don't have to. It's you don't have to go to school at all to, to do that uh, to learn that sort of stuff. It's a, it's just, it's a trade. Mostly, you know, um, like like any like anything else, I would say. Just a premise. Yeah. So so you could start off as a as a grip, whose guys lugging lugging cables uh, or whatever, or an electric, you know, grip or electric, and usually guys sort of double to do both. They'll be moving cables, or moving the flags, and moving all the C stands and all that sort of stuff, all the equipment that it takes to to, to do a film project or a video, whatever. And um, you just sort of learn it enough, and then you say like, you know, you get to the point where you can move up to being a gaffer. Or you know whatever. So sometimes gaffers can be um, can move up to being a, a cinematographer. Um, I liked to. I wanted to be a, a camera assistant because I knew I'd always be right next to the DP. Uh -huh. So I would always hear how he was lighting stuff, right. and he would be talking to the director, and I was right there all the time. So that was really important. So I just my job. What I what I wanted to do was learn as much as I could about the process. Right. And um, I got a chance to do it as the, as the camera assistant right. and work with some awesome directors. So do you try to take time with the people that work under you to bring them along? Or yeah, they just absolutely. Do their gig? Yeah, you? absolutely. We always try to move people up. Like even like you know my assistant in the office, you know, um, want to move them up because everyone wants to learn and grow, and you don't want someone who just wants to be an assistant for the rest of their yeah, life yeah. necessarily. Um, you want someone who, who wants to do what you do because they're always hungry for more, and you want to give them. You want to be able to give them more responsibility, and more um, you know things to do and more things to learn. So it should you know that's how I sort of came up, and, and I realized that you need to sort of foster that environment of you know um, trying to have people you know uh, move to that next level in their careers and right. stuff like that. And it's a good you know it's a, it's a it's a good thing. It's not a bad right, thing. Right. It's not. Some, when I, I remember when I started off as a camera assistant, um, it's a, it was a really small community here in New Orleans. So I was like, I want to be a camera assistant and talking to the, the, the first ACs or whatever. And at first they were sort of like, ah, who's this guy? And you know, all that sort of stuff. They really didn't, they didn't want me to, around. But I, but I stuck to it and they were like, okay, you're, you're in the club or whatever. So once you sort of show that you were really eager and um, wanted to learn and were serious about it and it wasn't just like a whatever, you know, passing sort of thing. Um, they were really cool about really taking me under their wing and teaching me whatever I, I wanted to know. That kind of community where you you bring each other along. Yeah. And some, so now moving up the ladder to the director position, <clears throat> now the the DP works for you, and you've got all the other responsibilities associated with it. You got to take care of actors. Could you talk about the responsibilities? Yeah, I remember the first. Um, short film short that I did when I was um, I think it was right before I started AFI as a director I was like okay well, I haven't really directed much because I've, I've mainly was a camera assistant um, and, and a DP and um, 
I remember the first short that we did, like the first shot, like it was, it was a little boy, and it was a story about a little boy and his dog. And we were all, they were on set, and, I, and, and the makeup person came and showed me the kid, and he was like, okay, he's ready, what do you think, it looks good? And I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever, I don't, I don't know, I don't know anything about makeup. Um, and, then, um, and then I'm thinking like, Afterwards, like right before we set up the shot, I was like, man, that kid looks like he had a lot of lipstick on. Like, why should a little boy have lipstick? It just looks really weird. It's a bad makeup job. Like, someone's got to tell him that. Someone's got to tell them that, that that's got to change. And I realized and that at the moment, you. that would be me. <laughs> so, um, so that was sort of the first learning experience. And honestly, like when I was, well, to step one second back, when I was um, a DP, like the first thing I'd ever shot was a feature. I actually had some friends that went here to, to Loyola. And, um, and I was at UNO at the time, and they had you know, a CP16 film camera and everything. So I took a class so I can rent the camera. We made a film together. And that was the, mo that was the most awesome learning experience because here we are, we're making a film. You know, we found someone paid a, a few bucks. You know, we had like $20,000 raised from one of the students' families or whatever. I guess they had a little money, and they wanted to help us out. And um, that, was the, that was the, I learned more on, in the first three days of shooting a feature than I probably have still ever learned in my whole career. Really? Because. You had to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, you had to figure it out, man. It's like, well, no one else is going to tell you how to do it. You got you to light it. You got to figure it out. You have to keep to the schedule or you're really screwed. Right. So that was, that was a really important thing. So I definitely encourage everyone to, to just, just go, go do, do it. it. So the skill set for a director would yeah. include what? So a skill set for director, um, and I haven't done a whole, you know, a whole lot of films, honestly, like because as soon as I, pretty much right after I graduated from from AFI, and um, and, and I made a couple of shorts, um, you know, um, I would started being a producer right away. So I have a limited experience in that, but basically, it's you know, um, it's learning, knowing how to talk to actors. You know, that's a really important thing. But really getting what you want out of them, and that's and that's a whole particular breed of people who have their own ways of sort of, you know, they have their methods and the ways of doing things. And um, it's but, difficult sometimes to, to, under, to know how to get into them, you know. I mean, basically, you know, what I would just basically talk to them about is like what, what I really wanted out of the scene and not, try to, not trying to be too fancy or artsy about it, just like, I want you to do this and whatever, but not trying to give them their lines and the way that, you know, don't have them uh, read their lines exactly. You know, don't read their lines to them. Like don't 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 like act it out for them. They don't uh, like. I know they don't like that. Yeah, right. So uh, they want to figure it out themselves, and that's the whole process. So it's that, and and knowing you know basically how you want to tell a story first of all. So you start off with storyboards or or a shot list or whatever. You know, after you get a, a script and a story that you, you really. So like. you really could sketch out the whole thing, do it Alfred Hitchcock style, and every yeah, yeah every you could do, scene. Is yeah, sketched. exactly. Sometimes you do that if it's a complicated scene, or sometimes you just write a shot list. I know I need a wide shot. I know I need a close up. I know I need a cutaway. Whatever, an insert shot of you know some you know some. And you object. design that list. You create that list. Yeah, as you, a director. Yeah, pretty much, and um, and then you are working with the cinematographer um, to to get the. You know, to talk about the mood and the style of shooting, if you want it to be, you know, the look of the the look of the film, whether, you know, whatever that might be, if, if you want it to look really, um, you know, uh, soft and pretty or really harsh and, and gritty, or whatever. There's so many ways you can obviously do it. Wouldn't certain DPs be better for one way than the other? I mean, not to have a style. Sometimes, I mean, that's that's one thing that's that's kind of not good about the Hollywood way, I guess, because. It's, Hollywood is very easy to pigeonhole someone into like, okay, you did, you're the comedy guy, you made a comedy movie, that's all you're gonna do is comedy movies. Oh, I see. And people hate that. I, well, I mean, like I'm the type of person where like I I did a really gritty kind of reality f film for my my thesis film that actually got me into the reality sort of world. Oh yeah. But I also did like a cute little kids film, so. I like to, you know, people have more range than just one style. Some people want to just be comedy directors. I'd like, I'd like to do a little bit of everything, right. you know. So, yes, I mean, generally, you definitely want someone who, you look at their, like for a cinematographer, you know, you, you look at their reel and you want to know that they can do what you want them to do. So it's, generally, you'll say, like, okay, this guy can shoot in this style, and that's a style that I like, or he has a cool sort of eye. Who's somebody you admire right now that's a great DP, a great cinematographer, in, um, in movies, whatever? Probably my favorite would be Roger Deakins is a great DP. I worked with him once on uh, on Dead Man Walking, and he was he was a pretty cool guy. And what makes was, him great? Well, you know, it's just his exactness of how he, he he shoots he shoots a film. You know, he he knows exactly what he wants. 
he, um, he, he, I don't know, working with him was really cool because, you know, he's the type of DP where he would light a scene with one light. Like we shot, like I remember this one scene that we shot for Dead Man Walking. And we're just in a room, it's Susan Sarandon in a room, and there's a 5K, which is a light that's about this big. And he just bounced it off of a board and cut it with a bunch of flags. And that was it. That was the whole scene. And it was a, it was a really important scene in the movie, but he just sort of did it like this, and he didn't even look at his light meter. He knew exactly what the, what the film stop was going to be, you know, the, the, the exposure was going to be. He's like, I know it's a 284 split. He'll check it just for the, for the ceremony of, of doing it. That's right, okay, and shoot the scene. He just knows his craft so well, and, you know, he, he's one of those types of DPs that just knows how to tell a story visually, you know. It's, a, it's its own... It's a whole, you know, another layer to the film right. that is more than just the, the characters and the script or whatever. It's a visual story. That makes you a better director, in a sense. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, go back to the skill set. So you've got to be able to, to be able to deal with actors, actors, with talent, and, and difficulties. Yeah. DP. DP and um, producers. Producers, yeah. Um, so that's going to be somebody in your case about the budget or about time or what are they? How, yeah, well, you, how, producers are, 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 they have that, those type of producers who are like line producers who are definitely, you know, on schedule and on budget and all that sort of stuff. But a lot of times, and I've worked with producers like this where they're creative producers as well, where they, they may come up with the idea or, or option a script or a story that they'll, that they'll do. I work with, I like to, when I'm looking for producers to work with, I want someone who's, I'm going to collaborate with, not just be the money guy, you know, because, you, it's the the more brains on a problem, usually oh, the better I yeah. find. Yeah. And you know, it's nice. I guess ultimately, when you're the director, and in my case, sometimes the executive producer, it's like ultimately my decision. Right. But it's nice to have that sort of support system of right. all these people who are really great at their crafts, and um, can will make you know collectively you'll make it better with synergy. You know. So, are you thinking about music as a director? Yeah. Are at the, how, what, what stage are you thinking about it? At the end? At the beginning? Where are you with that? I mean, it, it really depends on what the scene would be or whatever. You know, um, I've, I've done movies where I've, I play a little guitar and, and a little bit of music too. So I've done scenes in movies where I've, I've written the music for, for yeah. that. Um, go, I know what I wanted going into it. I know what kind of style it's going to be and it's going to be part of the scene. Um, but it's like anything else. It's just another, it's a, it's a, these are all... The way you look at it, it's all tools that you can use to make the film whatever you want it to be, you know. Um, so yeah, you definitely are thinking of, um, you know, a style, you know, of 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 music going into it because that that'll help you set the pace, that'll help you set the tone for the actors. Even you know, sometimes when I when I was doing movies, what I would do is I'd make a mixtape of music for the actors to listen to, or even the DP to listen to. Like, hey, this is music that inspires this, or even. Uh, paintings, you know, like I remember when I was making films, like, oh, this is a great Francis Bacon painting that is the style of, That's this is, this is, you know, I want you, this to inspire you. And because this inspires me, this is what I think about when I think of this yeah. scene or this moment or whatever. Same with the music um, and same with every other aspect of, of right. the, of the, of a film. And that's why, that's why I really love the craft because it really puts, you know, I have, I like to play music and, and um, draw and all that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> Film making was what I had found to sort of put all the, the creative, you know, talents and things that I love to do together right, right. in one medium where, you know, you're you're creating something new. And it makes sense. So as a director, you're also going to be dealing with the sound people. You yeah. Got to get your got to get the sound to the to the film. Uh, and what else? Um, with the, what with other the, skills are you going to? What other things do you have to do as a director? Wow, um, you, you're dealing with the sound. You're dealing, you're dealing with the editing as well. Um, After you know, the post production. In post production, that's a huge part of it, obviously. Um, you know, and, and and the same thing. You know, when I was when I made my thesis film, you know, I had a certain way that I wanted it to be, but the editor was like, oh, "I'll try out this. I'll try a scene this way," and he'll create a moment that I never even had thought of. That was like, this is awesome. Like wow, this is better cool. than I could have ever. I never imagined it this way, but it makes it so much better. Thank you. Let's put it in. You know. So that's it's 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 all part of that collaborative process. So it and, must be a thrill working with genuinely creative people at every step. Yeah, you and it's, this it's team. Right, and it, when everyone knows their craft really well, um, and it's you know it's just like it's like writing to them or whatever. It's just like they, they can do it effort, effortlessly. Um, it's great to work with people like that who really know what they're what they're doing, 
Um, but it's also great to, to you know, figure it out because I, that's how I started too. Like I had no idea how to shoot a movie. We're just going to do it. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of the fun of it as yeah. well. So. Well, if you're directing, you've probably got somebody right near you that you, you can just do this, do this. Not, I mean, who, who is that person? Um, you have an assistant director um, who is the person who really sort of makes the trains run on time on the set. They'll have, they'll have you know, whenever the act, you know, they'll know what scenes are, are going on when. They'll, um, they're also responsible for creating like a call sheet, which is like who's, who's, coming, who's, who's coming to work this day and what time they need to be there and all that sort of stuff. They're really the sort of master of the schedule. And they work really closely with the line producer and the production manager to make sure that you know, if someone's a half an hour late or the, if the production runs a half an hour late, that's going to cost you X amount of money because that's overtime and all those right, other right. things. So um, you, you know, as a director, your right-hand man is the AD who is um, really making sure that you're, you know, um, that everything is happening at the right time. Like you'll 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 block a scene with um, with actors, um, you know, to get the sort of general sense of where it is. The the, the cinematographer would be would be right there, and you, you're help you know you're working together to block the scene. Um, and then, then it's the DP set for a while. They're going to light whatever you just talked about. The actors go away. Sometimes the director would go away as well and just work on whatever else, preparing for the scene. And then, um, you know, it, and hopefully that, that'll be running on schedule. But it's the AD's job to make sure that the cinematographer is on time and, and not running behind and all that sort of stuff. Did, did it ever freak you out to know that you're spending $10,000 a minute or something? I mean... Um, try not to think of it that way. I mean, it's it's kind of cool to think that I've spent like twenty million dollars in, in a in a year for the past like six years or whatever. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. But you don't. I don't really think of it that way because it's really because it, if you think of it like I have twenty four episodes to do, and I'm going to be traveling around the country for the next nine months, and I have all this that I need to take care of. If you think of it like that, it is going to freak you out. Yeah. But it's really more like, okay, but no, I'm going to shoot this episode in four days, and I know that I have this amount of, you know, people working for the sure, working yeah. on this. Yeah, it's like bite-sized morsels is yeah. the way I try to think of it. It's like, okay, every day is like one little bit less that you have to do, and you know, if you, if you try not to think of it as the whole, but just like, okay, we're here's the process, and we're starting through it. Right. You know, that's then it's fine because yeah, it is awesome to spend that much money, but. <laughs> And, you know, uh, but it's also good to know, like, what the value of something is. Like, how much should a helicopter cost if I want to shoot a helicopter scene? You know, like, okay, that's going to cost me X amount. I know if I'm getting screwed on that and whether it's worth it. Like, what's the production value that right. I'm getting out of that for what I'm spending on it? You know, so that's another, you know, huge part of the decision-making making sort of process, the creative process. And I try to be responsible. Some, some producers and directors I work for could give a care less about what, you know, what the, if they're over budget or whatever, but I try to like, you know, be responsible about it and 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 like, okay, we're going to be reasonable and we'll we'll find a creative solution around something we can't afford to do, and usually that'll be better than spending all the money for the big, you know, crane or helicopter or whatever shot that you want to do. Is there somebody that's attending to the needs of the actors other than yourself? Um, I'm, I guess like production assistants or their own assistants generally, right. but I've never worked honestly. You know, I've I've worked on films like that, but I've never worked on a film big enough. Right, to right. say, like, yes, yeah, so I have actors, you know, name actors with assistants right, right. and all that sort of right. stuff. Well, how many minutes a day of footage can you get on a good day? On a film set, you'd probably expect about two minutes of footage. Two minutes a day? Yeah, two minutes of, of usable film. You've got to be kidding. No, hey, we could speed that up, man. I <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but it depends. If On a low budget, I've shot stuff where I'm shooting six pages in a day, which is basically the way that Brooks breaks down on a, on a film script. It's like a minute per page. Simple way to think of it. You know, a script is about 120 pages long, movies somewhere around that level as well. So, but I, you know, I've definitely worked on stuff where you're shooting five, six, seven pages a day if you need to. Um, but it really depends. You know, when I shot uh, my thesis film, uh, we had like five days, I think it was like five or six days to shoot the whole thing, and it was 30 minutes, 30 minutes long. Oh, so we had to crank through that. Right. You know, but the way that I sort of, um, allotted for that was like the style that I wanted to shoot it in. We ended up shooting it with yeah. video and making it a very sort of cops looking yeah. you know, film. So I know I can get a lot of stuff in the can and also not worry so much about the production value. Actually, what we did was make um, en enhance the production value that we had, make that work for us. 
you know, like we didn't have a lot of money to do it, but we got some cool locations. So we're like, okay, whatever, something it looks messed up. We want, we want it to look like reality. So we'll sort of, we'll, you know, put a, hang a lantern on the, the bad parts. And not to show like it's a bad film, but just sort of say like, hey, it's, it's real. It's, we're, you know, it's not a perfect process. If the cameraman for this film that I made was doing too smooth of a move, I would literally go up to him and huh. bump the camera because I wanted it to look bad. That's interesting. So uh, you know what shortcuts to take to suit the budget. If you've got limited money, you have to take shortcuts. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't know what shortcuts to take. It's just sort of it's out of necessity. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, this is, okay, well, it's what I got, and this is how we got to do it. So the same, you can get how many minutes from a TV show if you're on a day? Um, it depends. It depends on on if it's. I haven't done a lot of scripted real, uh, scripted shows, so I I, I wouldn't know. Um, probably I would say they they would shoot. I mean, I've worked on some films more, more as more as a camera assistant. They would shoot probably more than that. Probably four or five pages a day. I would I would say, but that's kind of a educated guess. I really don't know. Well, for to shoot a thirty minute show for mm -hmm. television in your world, it's going to take you how many days? About a week. Really? Yeah. Pretty solid work. Well, it, again, it depends. If you're shooting a scripted show, like they'll shoot, my friend of mine works on Ugly Betty, they shoot, that's an hour show, 40, about 42 minutes of, of right. ended footage, and they shoot that, and I think it's like eight days. Every eight days they shoot an episode. Um, when I did Top Model, which is a reality show, we shot every episode in about four days, sometimes three. Um, and that's to make, again, four, about 42 minutes of, of footage. Interesting. So. Okay, so we, we've kind of covered director and, and the people you're dealing with there. It's moving up a, le a notch. Now you've got to be producer. So now the producer's really interacting mostly with the director and the actors, or with, how would you describe that process? Um, again, it's, it's different in, uh, in reality TV and in film. Like a, a, an executive producer on a film is a much different person than an executive, uh, executive producer on a reality show. Yeah. Executive producer on a film is more the person who's like usually finding the money or buying the project or really kind of funding the whole I thing. See. The money guy. Um, in my experience, and being in a reality show, there are some of those people as well who are like the production company may get an executive producer. But my job is called showrunner. I'm executive producer and showrunner, and they have that they have that same title in scripted as well. Basically, my job is running the whole show. Like I'm responsible the way that I see it for everything. Everything that you see on, on, you know, from from keeping the show on budget, making sure the creative is right. And when I did Top Model, I was executive producer and showrunner. Although there were other EPs on the show, it was I really sort of took it as my responsibility to make sure that everything was right. And that's down to hiring. You know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't hire the PAs, but I would make sure that like someone was someone managing that in the right way. How do you get those gigs? How do you get the gig of being a producer for a show? Just ex you have experience, you have a track record, and people call you, or you sell yeah, I, ideas, or I, you know, it, it, many different ways as well. There's no there's no set rules to how Hollywood works. I, mean, I know some producers who just come up with an idea, know a guy, find an agent, sell a show. I'm an EP. All of a sudden, huh. like anyone in this room could probably do that. Although it might not be easy, but it could happen, and I've seen it happen. Um, I got really lucky. Uh, to be a producer because I was, as I was, as I was a director for Real World, I was also making another short film um, with um, my wife and some friends of mine and sort of producing that and directing and, and I wrote it. And I didn't realize that the, that the, the, the company that I worked for, which was Bunim and Murray, who produce, produces the Real World, and they still do, um, they sort of heard that I was doing that. And I think they saw that and they were like, well, this guy, he's producing his own stuff. Do you want to produce our show? And I was like, I didn't want to be a producer at that point. So they asked me to do it. I kind of told them no. And then talked to my wife and then 10 minutes later, I was like, yes, I would really like that job. It'd be stupid to not yeah. take that job. So um, yeah, so I just got a lucky shot, you know, and luckily I didn't up too bad. You made money for them. Yeah, I made a little money for them, exactly, yeah. yeah. So they called you back, and they called me back, yeah. and then I did a little, and then I did some other stuff, and then after I did my Real World, the CBS network executive, who put, put, the guy who put Survivor on the air and put Amazing Race on the air and put Top Model on the air, um, he he noticed, and I got called into his office, and he's like, "Oh, do you want to do Big Brother?" And I'm like, "No, I really don't like that show," <laughs> which was probably really stupid of me to say, but at the same time, he probably liked that someone would come into his office and say, no. "Like, I don't really like that show." <laughs> So um, being naive sometimes is definitely helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, 
so I did. I, so he offered me um, to do to work on Big Brother. I said no, and then I was like, "What else you got?" And then like a few weeks later, he called me. He's like, "Do you want to do Amazing Race?" And um, and I interviewed for the job. Didn't get the job. Um, talked to my agent. I was like, "Why didn't I get the job? I'm really good for this job. I know I can do it." And then I got another interview for the job, and then I got the job. Ah. So I got again kind of lucky. Um, to, to get that job. Well, and, when they call you in and they try to interview you for the job, what are they asking for? What do they want? What are you trying to communicate? You know, I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, what they were looking for in me, I think, is probably, because like when I interviewed for, like for Top Model, for example, I'm sure Tyra interviewed me to make sure I wasn't an asshole or a creep or whatever, and um, was just, can do the job. Like I had the track record, and, 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 and she knew that I would be her champion. Right. And that's what she was looking for, I think. And also the other producers in the show wanted to know that I can do the nuts and bolts technical stuff of it. And I sort of talked about my background in cinematography and background in, you know, in, in filmmaking and all that sort of stuff. And um, you know, the success of, of Amazing Race, which was ob obviously a huge plus. Right. And so I got that job. Can so you edit as well? I can't edit at all. That's one thing I definitely have no... I mean, I could do it if I had to, probably yeah, not yeah. an avid, like with the really uh, simple thing, but... No, the answer is really no. Yeah, you just want to hire a good editor. Yeah, I mean, I can tell an editor what I think. Um, I can tell an editor what I think works and why it works. I can sort of, you know, with a because I have a narrative background. That's another thing that AFI really was great for. Uh, for me, was it they really focused on storytelling and narrative storytelling, and sort of how to do that. And it's, it really, there's no trick to it besides really just doing it over and over again and learning how to tell a story that. Learning how to communicate a story in the right, in the best way that you can, you know. So that was a big thing for me was just learning how to tell a story, and then um, you know using those skills as well, you know, which translates sort of across the board into anything. It's really what's you know take all the stuff out that's not part of the story is really the the trick, you know. If it's not serving oh. your story, you cut it out. That's interesting. And you try to be as as efficient with all the story beats that you're trying to say. Like, don't go into long soliloquies about nothing. Make, if it's not, like, the, 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 the sort of two questions, I guess if there's a trick, this would be it. The two questions when I was a cinematographer that my teacher said, always ask, is who is your main character and what do they want? And huh. that sort of serves everything. Because if, if, you, if, if you can answer those questions, then you know who you're telling your story about. And then what do they want is everything that they don't want is unnecessary and you cut it out. That's great. Well, um, where do you see yourself in five years? Um, I would love to getting more back into narrative filmmaking and directing, um, but I also have you know have found you know uh, success in, in producing, and I really enjoy that a lot. So I'd love to be producing more television and selling shows and making money to sort of help fund my you know film career that I'd love to get back into a little bit. Do you write scripts? Not well. <laughs> so that's sort of the process. That's sort of the thing that, like, the, like if anything, I have a regret. That would be sort of it. Of like, you know, I've always wanted to get back into that, but I've been so busy doing, um, doing reality shows. It's sort of which take up all my time and traveling. It's hard to do that. But yeah, I definitely would like to. I, I've written scripts, n not great, and uh, you know, but have friends that help me make them better, and that's always a good thing too. I got a script for you. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, if, if somebody in this room wanted to come and hang out on the set of one of your TV shows in town, can they do that? Yeah, they can come. Um, we have, right now, um, we're doing the, the, make, the Extreme Makeover show. They're shooting in West Wego, which is, um, you know, on the West Bank, of course. And um, I think, I want to say, like what they have is like parking, parking and the people get shuttled in for the move that bus scene, oh, okay. which is like, at the, at the end of every episode, they do a big reveal of the, of the house to the family. I think that's on Thursday. I think it's on Thursday we're going to do that. Um, so I think it's like 2000 West Bank Expressway. Um, I don't know. I can, I, can, I can probably send it to you if, okay. if people are interested and Maybe. go into that. And it's, you know, it's just basically um, big crowds come and you can watch it happen, happen there. And to get in, involved in actually the process of, of making it happen, producing it, direct all, all that. Do you, mm -hmm. do you take young people to to carry things or whatever? I mean, Meaning what? Interns, assistants. Um, I haven't really like. Unfortunately, like a lot of the shows, 
that I've worked on, I think this is a little, probably a little bit different, but a lot of the shows that I've worked on have been competition reality shows, and the networks don't let us have interns ever because it's a potential confidentiality problem. Basically, oh. if you have an intern on the set and they leak a secret, you can't really fire them or sue them oh. because they, don't, they presumably don't have any money. Right. And, um, you know, they, they're not really an employee. They're just an okay. intern. So I haven't had a chance to do that. But, yeah, I mean... Uh, I'm sure there are there, there are interns on. The, I'm really new to the Extreme Makeover show. I've just started a few weeks ago, so and I, I think they have some interns. Yeah, so it would be. Is that where they do plastic surgery and fix your teeth and all that. No, that's that's one version of the show. <laughs> this is more like they they rebuild a house oh, in like seven days, which is actually a pretty a pretty awesome thing to behold. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't work on a show. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Anybody have any questions of our guest? Anybody interested in the film and TV world? A few takers. Greg? Test, test. Tech, check. All right. Very good. So are you from New Orleans or yeah. did you just go to? Born and raised. Went to Brother could, Martin. <laughs> could you talk about your experience of like getting out of college and like what was going through your mind at the time? Okay. And or like any of the opportunities or experiences that like came through your life. Yeah. That period? Um, after after I went to UNO, um, the first thing we did, like I said earlier, was was we made a film. Like I had some friends. We got together. And we're like, we're gonna make a film. It's probably a lot easier for I hate to say this, your generation, but kids like you to do that because you have access to things that we never had access to, like your own editing equipment, and you can buy a camera for $5,000 or less now. Or you can buy a great video camera for $5,000. that they sh They'll show films at Sundance. When I was coming up, they, they, they wouldn't show videos at Sundance. Now they will. So, um, so the first thing I did was, was shooting a feature, but you know that was a lucky sort of break. You know, friends putting, putting something together, and that was an awesome exp learning experience. But really how I made money and started was, you know, I started off as a PA, got a, just a friend of mine was working on a show. Um, they came to, when I was at UNO, they came to UNO looking for PAs to work on a project. Um, and I got hired for a day and then I got asked back. So that was great, um, you know, I have a job. Um, and um, started off doing that and then camera assisting. Uh, I camera assisted for a while and like just really went to New York and learn how to, some of the cameras worked and bought all the camera assistant books that I could to try to figure out how all this, all this you know, equipment works and started taking a few little jobs. I started working on like some um, small music videos, like just local, like a guy, you know, a, a, a camera guy who I found. I don't even know how I heard about the job, probably through school or something like that. Um, and uh, just started working, just work, you know, work as much as I can, just get, get a job as a camera assistant. I was like, like, that was my main goal, just like, okay, I just wanna work, wanna work, wanna work. And I did that for like five years here in New Orleans after, um, uh, after I graduated from college. Did you work like other jobs as well to get money? No, I was, I mean, you know, New Orleans is a, is a great city in that like, you know, at the time I had like, I was paying, I was living in Gentilly, I paid like 200 bucks a month for rent, so I had to work two days a month to, to make my rent. So that was pretty awesome. Um, and I just really focused on doing that and just you know working my own little art projects and stuff like that at the time. So um, you know, uh, I just tried to work it really as much as I can and, and, and learn as much as I can from different people. And I worked on some doc, you know, I, I, I got in, you know, it's always good to you know, wanna get asked back. So I started working for this one guy. He shot, I shot a rap video with him first and then he ended up doing all these documentaries. So it was a really small crew, it was like five of us. It was like the, the, the cameraman, the director, uh, me who was the AC and the, and the sound guy and, um, and a producer. And, we would, and I worked on, like, I don't know how I even got this job. Just, you know, worked for this guy a couple of times. He called me up, he's like, we're going, to, we're going to Columbia. We're gonna shoot a documentary about Pablo Escobar. I'm like, yeah, awesome, I'm in, totally. So I just started working for this guy, and I worked for him for like three or four years. And you know, as I sort of learned the craft and worked, day played on little movies here and there, like you know, a lot of movies that came into town or music videos for a day or two, just pick up little work as much as I could. 
and again, learned as much as I could from as many people and make, you know, it's, it's a pretty small community. It's probably a little bit bigger than it, probably a little bit bigger now than it was then, but that's a good thing for you guys, um, that you can work uh, and there's a lot of films going on in town. And just get in with people and be a nice guy and, you know, do what they say and listen and, and, and all that sort of stuff. It, it wasn't that hard to continue working. Basically, don't be a dick is the kind of rule that, I, you know, like just shut up and, and learn. And I did that as much as I could. And um, when did you move, like, from New Orleans out to another place? Or was it just like, was it the right opportunity at the right time? Well, after, after about five years of, after about probably four years of being a camera assistant and doing a little, little DP jobs here and there, little cinematography jobs here and there on music videos, you know, rap videos and stuff for my friends or whatever, um, and talking to all the guys in the business, you know, I, I realized like, okay, talking to the, the, you know, the, this guy who shot all these movies of the week that came into town, he was a cinematographer, and I was like, what do you make a week? You know, what do you make a day? You know, and it was like, I forgot what it was, like maybe like 700 bucks a day or 700 bucks a week or whatever it was. I was like, that's pretty good, but I want to make more than that. <laughs> so it's like, what do I got to do? It's like, well, you got to, you know, you got to go to Hollywood, you know. So I didn't really plan on going to Hollywood. I never wanted to be a Hollywood producer or move to California. I like being from New Orleans and I love living here. So I applied to film school. Um, and that's, you know, when I applied to AFI, I only applied to one school. And I knew it was really hard to get into. They only take like 25 cinematographers and 25 directors and like uh, nine editors every year for their program. So I was like, okay, I'll just, on an outside chance, I'll try out for this. And I went to the school and kind of liked it uh, and, and sort of moved into directing. And then I got a really lucky shot after, you know, my thesis film um, made it into Sundance, which it was like a, a, an AFI film hadn't been in Sundance in like nine years before that film was and I, you know it was just like a really lucky shot like and it was you know it just sort of happened just, you know from working as hard as I could on on the ideas that I had and whatever and it's, it's a little bit of luck and a lot of you know um, just learning as much as I could about the craft you know because I knew this is all I really wanted to do so and I knew the sort of area that I, you know that I was in like literally at home in my garage right now I still have my AC kit ready to go in case I need to go AC again. I know I won't, but it's sort of like that's the mentality. I'm like, okay, I love this job. And I, I would love to go camera assist again just to kind of, it's a fun job. I enjoy the work, you know, so I don't know if that really answers the question, but. It does, thank you. Calvin? There's all different types of reality shows, I, I would say. Um, I sort of came up in, well, when I was working on Real World, it was before reality had really started. And I learned a method of like, you know, we're going to do it as, it as real as we can, as, as, as much of a documentary process as we can. We're not going to insert ourselves into the, into the world. You know, you know like by, by nature of doing any documentary, you're going to change the environment, you know, um, because you're there with a camera, and that that's not natural. So, um, but as as, as we, we tried to keep as true as we could to documenting these seven kids' lives who were who were here. Um, and again, it was before it had really taken off, and people you know are making careers out of being a reality star, or whatever. It was just seven kids who wanted to try this little experiment out. So I was really lucky to have that experience, and I've taken that with me since the beginning. Now, there, there are reality shows, I've seen it, where people will say, like, okay, you know, go call that girl and start something, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, I That'll don't... do it. <laughs> I don't like to work that way. Like, I've been lucky enough to not have to work on shows like that. So, the closest I would say I've gotten to that is when we did Top Model, um, and they're still shooting it now, obviously. Um, the sort of way that I looked at it was situation reality, where we know we would create a situation of like, okay, girls, you're going to walk on a runway, and it's, it's on water, and you're going to maybe fall off of it or whatever. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's a little manipulative, but at the same time, all the reactions are real. So we're setting up something with that, you know, everyone who's ever seen the show sort of 
any contestant on the show knows what they're getting into. It's a modeling competition, but at the same time, we're going to shock you and we're going to make it wacky and weird and whatever and hard on you. So we would produce it for, we kind of knew what a reaction would be. Like, okay, we're going to shoot a photo shoot with a spider. Girls don't like spiders. It's going to be great. You know, it's real simple. Real, real simple. That's, that's sort of, I can boil it down to that simple sort of aspect. But once you introduce the spider, everything is real. And, that, and hopefully that's still the case on the show. It was certainly when I was there. Of like, these are real reactions or whatever. Um, there, are, there, there are shows like Flavor of Love where it's sort of like you're casting for you know, the most outrageous and wild people you could find, you know, um, and you are putting them in situations that, again, you know are going to be titillating and exciting and controversial and, and, um, and, and, uh, and to create as much conflict as you possibly can. And, um, you know, I can appreciate that, but, you know, I try not to work on shows like that. And the big reason that I took the job that I'm, I'll be working on next year is because it's not really, you know, it's a different kind of show, really. You know, the, the family reactions are, are really real, and they really do build the houses in a day, and, uh, in a week. And um, that's kind of cool to really be changing someone's life for the better. So um, it's sort of, it, 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 there are so many different types of reality shows, it's hard to say that you know, every, every production company that literally that I've ever worked for has a completely different philosophy of, of how to do it and a completely different method and a completely different structure of how even the cameramen work and the, and the producers work and all that sort of stuff. Some shows, the segment producer, Deals with the deals with the cast, and some they own, they never deal with the cast, and they only deal with you know setting up a scene or whatever. So it's 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 kind of you know it's more organized than it was eight years ago, I guess when I started. But it's still pretty much the wild west. There's no like film sets. You know what it's going to be like. There's a structure. There's a hierarchy. It's a it's a standard way of of doing things. It's proven and it works and, it, and it's worked that way for a hundred years. Um, reality, it's sort of like, oh, let's throw this up on the wall and see if it sticks. So, Wild, wild west. Well, I think our time is up, but uh, we want to thank Anthony Dominici for coming. Thank you very much. That was great. Thanks a lot. Thank Appreciate it. <laughs>